Hey folks, Kempo is primarily a street self-defense art and one of the main skill sets that you learn and acquire through Kempo training is how not to get hit and how not to get hurt. So obviously blocking of strikes is extremely important and it's one of the foundations of all the techniques we do because all of our, our self-defense techniques include blocks with counter strikes. So what we're going to cover right now is the proper way to do our basic blocks um, we also have some more sophisticated blocking that we do later on, but for, at this belt level, in the beginning of your, of your training, it's really important that you master just the basic blocking sense. So, first one we're going to do is we're going to cover some of the ground rules. Now, on all of our basic blocks, what we want to do is we want to have a 45 degree angle on our arm. The reason for that is the bent arm is going to give us a lot more power and a lot more stability when we block. Another principle and rule that we want to employ is what we call the pinky leads the way, which means that wherever the strike is coming from, your pinky is going to go to meet it. So if we're going to do an inward block, the pinky comes out. If it's an upward block, the pinky goes up to the strike. If it's an outward block, the pinky goes out. Pinky leads the way. Reason for that is if your pinky is going towards the strike, it's going to ensure that your forearm bone is what's meeting the striking arm or the leg if it's a kick. And that's a hard bone as opposed to blocking on the inside of the arm. So our first block we're going to cover is our inward block. And we're going to do all our blocks from our neutral bones. It's our basic fighting stance and it will be the position you would be in once an attack occurs and you get into your stance. So we want to start with our hand up, center position. This is our master key position. From this position we can go inward block, outward block, upward block, or downward block, whatever we need to do. Okay, so knees bent, good neutral bow. Now the inward block is deployed usually for a straight punch that's coming at your head, your face, or a hook punch, and it's, and it's an inside or outside the arm uh, block. So from this position, we're gonna shoot our, our blocking arm out to the corner. Now if you were to picture that I was standing in an invisible box, then my block is gonna go to the corner of the box. I want to be very careful not to overblock because if I overblock, one thing is I straighten my arm and I make myself susceptible to a hyperextension if the attacker grabs my arm and bends it. The other thing is if I overblock, I create an opening for a strike. So we want to make sure that we're in our a perimeter here. Picture an empty box, I'm going to the corner, but I also want to stay within just slightly past shoulder. Uh, distance. So we're going to do our inward block from here. We want to keep it up here, head level, because we're protecting this section of the body with our block, and we snap it. We make our block a strike. We want to deploy the block hard enough and fast enough that when it hits the striking arm, the, the attacker will think twice about hitting you again. So again, we're going to snap the block out. One, two, three, four, just like that. Same principles apply to all the blocks. The next block we're going to do is our upward block. Master key movement in the upward block is we're coming up the center as if we're going to do an uppercut punch. So if you were to picture a board here, I'm going to come up the center. When I get to about my eyebrow level, I'm going to turn my wrist and bring my block up. The reason for that is that extra torque is going to add a little more power into the strike because someone who's coming down with a downward strike is using gravity to increase the power of their strike, so the strike is going to be pretty forceful. So by coming up the center line here and torquing our wrist at the last minute, we add a little bit, little bit extra power to our block. Other thing to keep in mind too, my fist is slightly past the center of my head. It's not at the center of my head and it's not on this side. It's slightly past the center of my head, 45 degree angle on my arm, and my arm is bent almost if I were to have a pyramid here, okay? This is one side of the triangle, and the reason for that is if the strike comes down, it's like the roof of a building, the rain comes down and it rolls off. Well, the same thing, by having the arm bent and pitched at 45 degree angle, if the strike comes down, it'll slide off and deflect off of your head. 
common mistake we see a lot with beginners is they do their upward block like this in a horizontal position. The problem with that is if the strike comes in and it's powerful, it's going to go right through the block and you're going to end up hitting yourself. So if I were to go from this side, when I do my upward block, I'm going to come up, snap in here. This is the proper position. There's about a fist, slightly past a fist, fist and a half away from the head. Okay, we don't want to wear it like a hat. We tell the beginners, you don't wear your upward block like a hat. And we don't want to bring our arm just straight up horizontally. We want to make sure we're coming up, master key movement, and snapping. And that's our upward block. We'll, we'll do a few from here. So from center position, we got our inward block. And we have our upward block. One, two, three, four, just like that. Next block, basic block, is our what we call our extended outward block. This is for somebody coming in with a haymaker, power, power roundhouse punch. From center position, we're going to bring our arm out like this, and pinky leads the way again. So it's palm facing out. There's torque and uh, strength with the vertical 45 degree angle. From the side, bring it out here, boom. Now notice my hand isn't back here close to my head. It's out here. Again, if you picture that I'm in an invisible telephone booth, okay, invisible box, I want to go to the corner of the box. So my inward block is here. My outward block is here. If it's back here, I'm not going to have the strength. I won't have the 45 degree angle. So I want to be out here to meet the block. Because again, this is a power strike defense. So as the block, the punch comes in, we step back and snap the block. Boom. Hard. Okay. So again, neutral bow, inward block, boom. upward block, extended outward block. Boom. The last of our basic blocks is our downward block. This would be against an uppercut punch or possibly a kick. From our center position, we're going to come down center line, slightly past our hip here, to deflect the kick. Boom. Again, we want to be really uh, sure that we don't straighten our arm, particularly against a kick. The leg is very strong when it strikes, and most people's legs are going to be stronger than your arm. If you straighten your arm on a downward block, and they hit the back of your elbow, you could end up with a broken arm. So we want to come down and keep the arm bent at 45 degree angle and snap it. Boom. Boom. We want to snap all our blocks. Inward block. Boom. Upward block. Boom. Outward block. And downward block. They all snap and they come back up to position. Those are the basic blocks that we use in Kempo. Uh, we have, again, like we have more sophisticated blocks that we're going to teach you later. Um, and we, we have one other outward block that we do. Uh, it's called a vertical outward block. You'll see it in some of our forms, short, uh, short form one, long form one. The difference between the vertical and extended outward block is range. Again, the extended outward block is for somebody coming in with a power punch and you're stepping back into a good base and blocking. The vertical outward block is if you're closer in, you're going to come up palm in this way. So it would be an inward block like that. And in this case, you actually are blocking with the tender part of your arm. But it works because you're closer to the attacker, so you're not going to be taking a full-on haymaker punch. This would be more for somebody who's close in, close quarter combat range, and you can twist and block. So again, we have our inward block, our upward block, extended outward block, downward block, and vertical outward block, palm in. So, uh, the last block uh, I want to show you today in our basics blocking is the X block. It's a couple of... Uh, we have several techniques that we use the X block. Um, mainly, if, you, if it's an overhead strike, you can step back, right hand over left, you're gonna do an X pattern over your head. That will deflect against a weapon or a strike. It's a nice strong block. If you notice, I'm in a forward bow stance. Okay, X block, so I'm stepping back. Boom. And also, you can deploy the X block on a low line pattern. If someone came in with a kick, you could block like that. We have, uh, in the, in the brown belt uh, level, we have a few techniques, the knife defense technique where we deploy X block patterns. So the X, we're making X with our hands. It's a good bracing point, it's an open-ended triangle. And that's another block uh, that we use in our basics, basic Kempo. Um, again, all these blocks have sophisticated motion and elements that we add to it later on in the system. Right now, at, in the beginner stages though, 
it's really important to just master the basic blocks. They're in all of our techniques, all of our self-defense techniques. They're in all of our katas and forms, and they're in all of our sets. So uh, again, you make your block a strike, pinky leads the way, and 45 degree angle. Those are the three master uh, key principles that you want to keep in mind when you're doing the basic blocks. Thanks. Hey folks, now that you have an understanding of the basic blocks, what we're going to teach you today is a blocking pattern or a set that we uh, use in our beginner program. It's called, there's two names for it, it's called blocking set one, but a common name that a lot of uh, people use in Kempo is also called star block set. The, uh, it deploys all of the basic blocks that we, we've discussed, the upward block, inward block, outward block, downward block, and a couple other extra moves. And we do it in a set. A set is a arranged series of basic movements done in a, in a pattern that allows you to practice them and memorize them and combine basic movements uh, in a way that you can practice them efficiently, quickly, but cover a lot more material than if you were just to isolate. So uh, the star block set is required for our yellow belt and our orange belt students uh, we, from Tiny Titans up to the adult program. And it uh, goes back to the Shaolin Temple, the original 18 hand movements that they learned at the Shaolin Temple when Bodhidharma brought the arts to, uh, to China. It's, um, so it's been around a long time and it's, it's a very important part of the American Temple system. So, what we'll do is, again, because it's a set, it's a training set, we're going to start in a horse meditation position. And this is for practice purposes. So we're going to, we're going to do a, a series is up, in, out, down, back, check. So we're going to go with upward block. And as I do the upward block, you notice my back hand is coming into a chamber position, back elbow. So we do upward block, then we go into an inward block. Outward block, downward block, back, elbow, and check, palm heel push down. Now, there's a hidden motion in here. When we go from the up, in, out, down, right before I go to the back check with the elbow, I'm bringing my arm up. There's our vertical outward block. So it's in there. So it's up, in, out, down. Vertical outward, back elbow, check. Then we do it on the left side. Up, in, out, down. Vertical outward, back elbow, check. Now we're going to do doubles. There's our X block. In, out, down, double vertical outward, back, check. Right hand over left. Palm heel push down. I'll do it from the side so you can see it from this angle. Up, in, out, down, back, check. Up, in, out, down, back, check. Up, in, out, down, back, check. That's star block set, also known as blocking set one. This section of our uh, basics video is meant to cover uh, different kinds of, of blocking motion that we use that they deviate a little bit from our standard blocks. Um, they're a little more sophisticated, but we deploy them in all of our self-defense techniques. So the first one I wanted to cover with you right now is a basic parry, uh, which is a deflection. It's not technically a block, it's a deflection of a strike. So I'm going to ask Jeff to come out and uh, join me. Okay, difference between a parry and a block. If Jeff were to throw a punch, okay, he's coming at my face. Now if I were to do a block, again we said in our, our other video we want to make our block a strike, I would do a hard block. A parry is a little bit different though, because a, a parry isn't a contact block, it, rather it's a deflection. So as the punch comes in, I'm going to deflect the block. It guide it past my head. So if he throws the punch, I parry the block here. Now, 
Very important rule on our blocks. If we're going to block on the outside of the arm, we want to block at or above the elbow. Reason for that is, I'll pull his sleeve up here so you can see his elbow. If I block below the elbow on the outside, he can collapse his elbow and strike me. So the rule is, when we're blocking on the outside of the arm, we want to block at or above the elbow. Same thing with a parry. If he's throwing a punch and I'm going to parry, ideally I want to step here so my arm is at or above the elbow. Inside of the punch though, it's the exact opposite. We want to block at or below the elbow here. If I were to block up here above the elbow on the inside, I'm going to get hit. So it's a very important rule to remember. But again, let's go back to the parry. He throws the punch. The hand's coming up. It's kind of like I tell uh, the beginners, it's like slicking your hair. You're going to come up, parry. Now from here, there's a lot of different strikes that we can deploy. Okay, if I were to do an inside parry, same thing. Here, I can only do a punch. So a parry is a great way to open up uh, position so that you can strike and also deflect from getting hit. Uh, we could do a parry with a, with a kick. If you were to kick, rather than me doing a hard downward block, I can also parry with a glancing strike here and come up. And that's one of our self-defense techniques. So that's, that's a parry. Um, we combine the parries with strikes and we combine the parries with multiple, multiple parries. I can do a double parry. So if I can do the backhand here or I can do a double like that, that's called a double factor. So when we do a double factor, we can do a double factor with a parry or with a strike. One other thing too, a parry is usually done with an open hand. A block, we do want to do with a closed hand. But if I'm going to do a double factor, let's cover that. If he throws a punch, I'm going to step back. I'm going to do an inward block. And then my double factor is basically just a series of two movements, a double factor, inward block, and I'm going to come up with a parry. So it's inward block, parry, strike. So one, two. There's my double factor if we do it on the inside. One, two. So the way it looks fast, the outside, okay? That's a double factor, double strike. One rule to remember on this is you block with the, your front hand because it's closer. Your second parrying hand is going to travel on the outside of your original blocking hand. If you try to come on the inside, you're going to check yourself. So you want to come on the outside, and then you can come in and do whatever movement you want to do as a counter. So that is a basic parry and double factor. Thanks. Next we want to do in our specialty blocking, I'll ask Jeff to come out again. I want to cover checks and uh, particularly right now at this level, a, what we call a waiter's tray check. Now the difference between a check Check is different than a parry or a block. Again, a block is an offensive, a defensive offensive move where we're actually deploying power. A parry is a deflection. There's different kinds of checks. Now, if I were to do a block with my front hand, I have my hand up here checking just in case he were to throw the other hand. Okay? So I call this a positional check. It's in position ready if we need it. Okay? We also have what we call pinning checks. So if you were to throw a punch, okay, if I were to block the arm, I could come in this way, block the arm, and then I could pin his arm. Now I've got it pinned to his body and checking. So if I were to come in here, or if you were to throw the other punch, I can block with this arm, and this is a pinning check. Okay, those are basic checks that we're using. We also have leg checks. If you were to step in with a punch, okay, and I block, I can come in knee to knee, and I have a leg check here, I can also use to uh, destabilize his base, take his power base away. So we have, if you combine those, you're going to have a lot more power on your self-defense techniques and a lot more power in, 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 in all your movements. Um, another one I want to use, that, which I teach you that we do a lot, is called a waiter's tray. If Jeff were to throw a punch, I step back with the inward block. A waiter's tray is basically a positional check. I'm going to come up over the arm here, just like if I was carrying a tray as a waiter. And again, it's at or above the elbow because I'm on the outside of the arm. From here, though, I can do a series of moves. If he were to move his arm in any direction, I'm maintaining 
contact, so he can't come back at me. Okay, he's trying it, and I've got him checked. So it's a waiter's tray check. Nice thing about the waiter's tray check too is the position of my hand. Is that if I come in here with a strike, I also have right here a strike to the face that I could do. So the way we could combine these is inward block. Now I'm going to come in with a counter strike. I'm going to do a double factor. With my strike, here's my waiter's tray. Now I come in with a leg check, and then I come in with another strike. So that's one way to combine the basics into a self-defense technique. Think of the basics as if you're learning the alphabet, your letters, A, B, C, D. Once you get the basics down, then you start combining them into words. Once you get the words down, which is basic two, three movement techniques, then you combine them into sentences and paragraphs of motion. That's when we have all the more intricate uh, black, brown, and black belt techniques with the extensions, and we have our katas and our forms. So it's one way to think about it, or, or as if you're learning music. You learn the musical notes first, the scales, then you learn the chords, and then later on you can improvise, and that's really what um, training in martial arts and learning martial arts is about. It's that you just take the basic movements, and then you're combining them, sophisticating them, and then ultimately you get to the point where you can spontaneously improvise movement depending on the situation. So that is the basic parry, waiter's tray, and check. Uh, one other thing I wanted to teach right now, and very important, this is just straight out of boxing, is how to slip a punch. So if Jeff and I were squared up here and he were to throw a punch, okay, a slip is just a head movement. Now I can combine a slip with the parry, if you were to throw the other one, okay, I can combine a slip with a parry, always a good idea because the parry is checking the arm, but I can also just move my head. Okay, I can do it this way if he throws the other one. Okay. One thing about slipping a punch though, it seems counterintuitive because my head is going to go in the direction of the punch. If he throws his left hand, I'm gonna, I don't want to parry this way, I don't want to parry to the left because I'm opening myself up to his other hand. So I want to go seemingly toward the direction of the punch. So if he punches, I want to slip toward the punch. If he throws the other one, I want to slip towards the punch. So um, it takes a little bit of practice. You have to recognize the strike. And if we're sparring and he's throwing a punch, okay, I want to make sure I parry here. Now, I always encourage people, get the check up as well. It doesn't matter which hand, they both work. It just depends on what you want to do next. From here, I've got a punch here. From here, I've got a strike here. A lot of options. It's infinite possibilities. But uh, that's, that's slipping a punch. Other basic boxing type movement we want to do is bobbing and weaving. You've seen this in, in box, you know, a lot of boxing uh, uh, instruction. We, we teach this. He's throwing the punch. Okay. Bobbing is like a sewing machine. It's an up and down movement. So I'm going to bob and come up like that. Important to keep in mind, though, what I don't want to do, and a common mistake a lot of people make is they look down. Once I take my eyes off the attacker, I open myself up to surprise uh, strikes. I always want to keep my eyes on the attacker. So if I'm going to bob under a punch, I'm going to keep looking at him. He throws the other one, I come up. I can come back down. If he throws a hook punch, I can bob under. Okay. So bob is just up and down movement. And then we combine that with a weave. A weave is a side to side movement. Again, so side to side, side to side. That's the weave. It's side to side. Bob is up and down. Okay, so we combine those. He throws a hook. I bob. If he throws a straight punch, I weave. Hook, bob, straight, weave. So those are basic boxing um, maneuvers that we also use in Kempo. We've covered, we've covered the bob and weave, the slip, Checking, parrying, double factor. Um, that's most of the basics that you're, you're going to need, at least in the beginning section of your Kempo training. And uh, just keep practicing. The, the more you practice, well, the better everything's going to be. So train hard. Okay, folks, now we're going to cover kicking, basic kicking. Uh, there's many, many different types of kicks that we use in Kempo. 
One of the kicks that we teach first, though, because it's an uh, awesome self-defense uh, use, is the front snap kick, also known as the front ball kick. Now we call it a ball kick because the part of the kick we're going to, part of the foot we're going to be kicking with is the ball of our feet. I, I, I tell people if you were to stand on your tippy toes, that the part that's hitting the ground, that's what you're going to kick with. So it requires you to peel your toes back, and you're going to hit with this part of the foot here. Reason for that is it's going to give us the penetration we need. We talked about in one of the earlier videos the difference between penetration and dissipation of energy. Penetration goes into the target and and it's, it it. Um, concentrates the energy of the strike into one specific spot so it hurts more. Dissipation spreads the energy out and it hurts less. So a, a front snap kick or a front ball kick is a penetrating kick. Now basic mechanics from our neutral bow, okay, what we want to do, and this is basic kicking mechanics anyway, from our neutral bow, we're going to pivot our hips toward the target and we're going to lift our knee up and cock it. Okay. Now the reason for that is this position is a master key movement because from this chambered position, I can kick in a lot of different directions. So we have to point our knee, we have to lift our knee up, we have to point it at the target. So in this instance, the target is the groin. A front snap kick is different than a front thrust kick. We'll show you that one later. But this is a front snap kick, the target is the groin. So we want to position our hips and then we want to point our knee at the groin. We're going to snap the kick out hit the groin, recock, and come back. Now really important that we snap the kick out and recock it as fast as we snapped it out. It avoids what we call dead legging. Dead legging is, is a, a problem that we see in a lot of beginners. When you're kicking, you snap it and rechamber. So if I were to go this way, I'm going to snap and rechamber and come back into my stance. Dead legging is when we don't rechamber. We kick. And then we just bring our leg down straight. Problem with that, because my leg is here, if you're going against someone with skills, they can sweep your leg, break your leg, and cause you all kinds of injuries. So always want to recoil. The other reason we recoil is we may have to throw more than one kick. You know, if there's several attackers, we may have to kick in several different directions, so you want to recoil to have your, your master key position. All right, very important, targeting on the front snap kick is the groin, as I said. But we're not going to kick horizontally. We're going to kick vertically. What that means is from this position my foot is actually going to come up under the groin. Okay, I'm coming up under the uh, testicle area if it's, a, if it's a male attacker and snapping the kick. It's not a horizontal thrusting type kick where I'm hitting the front of the groin. I want to come up under in a vertical position. So the kick looks from here, neutral bow, we pivot, throw the kick up, boom, and back down. Boom, back down, and that's the front snap kick. Next kick we're going to show you is the front thrust kick. Starts out just like the front snap kick, difference is in the snap kick, we're kicking vertically up into the testicles. A thrust kick is meant to go horizontally and to push the attacker away. So it's a power kick. We're, again, we're kicking with the ball of our foot, but we're going to push in a horizontal position. Mechanically, what we're going to do is, when we chamber our leg here, we want to sink our hips. So we want to come and sink our hips in, pushing the attacker away. Thrust, again, okay? thrust. Don't want a dead leg. That's the front thrust kick. Next kick I want to show you today is the roundhouse kick. There are several types of roundhouse kicks, and which one you're going to do depends on the setting, whether you're in a sport fighting scenario or whether you're on a street self defense type of situation because the mechanics of the kicks and the weapon, the part of your body that you're going to use as the weapon, point of contact, will vary depending on the setting. So the first uh, roundhouse kick I want to show you is the front leg roundhouse. The reason we show you the front leg roundhouse first is because the front leg will be closer to the attacker, which means 
it's faster. It's, it's easier for me to get my front leg from here to here than for me to get my back leg to cover a greater distance. So this is called a foot replacement roundhouse. From my neutral bow, my back leg is going to come up and plant. I'm going to cock my knee at the target. I'm going to thrust it out, pull it back, and reset. Okay, so basic motion, again, pointing our knee where we want to kick. Okay, I step up, I cock the knee, I kick it, pull it back. Now, different types of kicks. If it's a street self-defense setting, I want to kick with the ball of my feet, the ball of my foot, so I get penetration. Most often we're going to be wearing shoes, so you, the shoe is going to enter in, in a concentrated area, cause more damage than if I were to kick with the top of my foot. We see a lot in karate tournaments, in old style karate tournaments, where people are kicking with the top of their foot, and that's okay in a sports setting where you have padding on your foot and the objective is just to score points. But out in the street or in a professional fighting situation, that's going to get, and probably lead to a broken foot. So uh, I would prefer my students to kick with the ball of their foot or use their shin rather than the top of their foot. Um, but again, I want you to learn all different ones. So again, the front leg roundhouse on a street situation, can I borrow Jeff for a second? I ask Jeff to come out. We're here, if he's fighting. I want to, my target would either be the groin or the solar plexus or the head depending on what my objective is. But in a street situation, I want to kick with the ball of my foot and recock. So groin, recock, okay? If it's a tournament setting, like I said, the top of the foot, and all you want to do is score points, then you could kick that way. Again, those are the two differences. Um, and then the third style is what we call the Muay Thai kickboxing style. Muay Thai is, is a very, uh, strong and aggressive art. We teach it here at Veritas and it destroys limbs and breaks bones. We're kicking with the shin. So, and we do use this in Kempo. Um, there's two, we can, what we want to do, and again, we're using front leg roundhouse right now. But if I were to do that, I would want, my target would either be the joint in a uh, street scenario or the inner thigh if we were in a ring or a cage. So, I'm going to come here, foot replacement again. I'm going to step up. And I'm going to kick with my shin, spreads him out, destroys his base. So if we were fighting, I would come in, okay? Very hard, powerful kick. And that's with the front leg. Um, so the, the weapon changes are the stuff, will, the weapon changes are dictated by your environment and the setting. The motion, however, is the same. It's a circular motion, and we're getting the power from the torque. One of the main things is we have to put our hip into our kick. So if you notice, I'm not just throwing my leg out. When I come up in, I want to torque my body. The way I do that is my hip, my planted foot torques, pivots, okay? This is, the, the, my bottom foot, my twisting is what turns my hip around for the extra power. That's the front leg roundhouse. Our next kick we want to teach you is the back leg, rear leg roundhouse. Again, the pattern of motion is a circle, roundhouse kick, and torque is the power principle. The most important thing to remember on the back leg roundhouse is we've got to get our hip around. And again, the way we're going to do that, a couple of ways to do this kick, but the way we're going to do it right now is our front foot we want to torque as we kick. So when I bring my foot up, you notice my, my planted foot is spinning. So from my neutral bow, I spin and it gets my hip into the kick. And this is in a Kempo Street self-defense type uh, kick. Muay Thai style kickboxing kick, a little bit different mechanics because that is, uh, if we're going to do it in a, a ring or a cage, our stance will be a little different so the mechanics change. But right now we're concentrating on the Kempo back leg roundhouse. We, we cock and rotate our planted foot, which gives us the spin. Now, if we want to add some extra power into the kick, or if we need to change the angle for the kick, another technique or um, motion we can deploy is switching our front foot and stepping out. If you notice, 
from my neutral bow, if I step out, it's already bringing my hips into play, and then I can deploy the kick. We use that type of maneuver in one of our yellow belt techniques called attacking mace. So if Jeff were to step in, okay, and we'll demonstrate it in attacking mace. If Jeff were to throw a right punch, I come in with an inward block, I punch. Now, if I were just to do a back leg roundhouse kick from this position, the angle won't permit me to hit the targets. He's too close. So I have to open up a little bit of space and my target, because this is a street defense, is primarily I want to hit soft tissue. So I want to hit the groin preferably. So I'm going to do my block and my punch. Now the punch may back them up, but it may not. Okay? I got to change my angle though, because otherwise only a knee really would work. To do that, I'm going to take my front foot and I'm going to off angle. It turns my hips towards the target, but allows me to get in to where I want to go. So again, we step off throw the kick, and that adds a little bit more power. A Muay Thai style roundhouse kick from the back leg, again, very devastating kick. We're going to take our, our back leg, kicking with the shin again, and we're going to come in this way, switch. Another way I can do this, and we do this in a lot of our Kempo techniques, is on a chopping downward angle, I kick at the joint or the thigh, and I want to come down on this pattern, like that. Very devastating. We uh, use that kick in a lot of our advanced brown and black belt techniques. So both of those um, are awesome kicks. A lot of power. Uh, they can be fight stoppers. And um, again, the power principle is torque. It's a circular motion. So that's the roundhouse kick. Uh, one thing I want to cover with you on the roundhouse kick in particular is, and I'll ask Jeff to come out for this one. Um, a lot of people when they start out, and particularly when they start sparring, they get fixated on the head, and they, you know, they want to kick the head, kick the head. You see it a lot in movies. It's kind of spectacular. It, it looks really good. In a self-defense situation, though, the, the problem with the head kick is you have to cover a lot of distance. If Jeff and I are, are fighting, and Jeff's going to kick me in the head, okay, he has to bring his foot all the way from the floor up to my head. Now I'm, I'm about six feet tall. That's a lot of distance to cover and it takes a little bit more time. So in Kempo, we encourage our students to, whenever possible, use low line kicks. And what we mean by that is waist or below. You think about it, his groin targeting again. Groin, knee joint, foot stops, shin. Very, very vulnerable and painful when they're struck. Yes, you can get a knockout with a head kick, but it's going to be very dependent on your athletic ability, your speed, your timing, and you really, really, really have to have that kick down to um, almost master level to pull it off consistently. There are many martial artists that can do that, but again, if you're talking about a self-defense situation where minute split hair seconds make the difference between injury or death, you want to kick what's closest, and you want to kick what you can hit the fastest. So a head kick probably would not be a, a primary choice in most self-defense situations. If you are going to kick the head though, again, same uh, principles apply. You want to kick either with the shin to the head or the foot. You do not want to kick with the top of your foot. Okay, That's oh, tournament style, um, and it's, it's going to get you injured. It's just, just bone there. There's nothing to protect the top of your foot there. So you want to, again, hit with the ball of your foot. Um, and now we do kick the head in Kempo, but what Mr. Parker used to say is it's easier to kick the head once we bring the guy down. So if Jeff and I were in a, in a self-defense situation and he were to attack me and I were to throw a punch here, now I could try to kick his head, but again, all the problems we just discussed come in. But if I take him to the ground, now it's a lot easier for me to hit the head. So keep that in mind. Uh, everything in Kempo is logical, and everything we do is sequential. So if you, know, if you want to practice head kicks, first master the low line kicks to get the mechanics, and then you can stretch and get your flexibility increased. And if you're able to increase your speed, flexibility, and timing to the point where you can pull that kick off, 
consistently, then you know more power to you, and I encourage you to do it. It's great athletic, and you see it a lot in UFC fights. Uh, you know, it's, it's very it's very spectacular and exciting to watch. But again, in a self defense situation, which is primarily what Kempo is designed to uh, be used for, split seconds matter, and it's a lot easier to kick a knee. Boom! I can kick his knee a lot faster, or his groin a lot faster than I can bring my leg all the way up to hit his head. Thanks. Next kick I want to teach you is the scoop kick and the spur kick. Uh, they're basically the same pattern of motion front and back. Now a scoop kick gets its name, um, it's also known as a shovel kick. It gets its name from the motion of a shovel. What I like about this kick is it's easy to deploy because your foot positioning for the kick is, is, um, presents itself a lot more than a lot of other style kicks. So in most self-defense situations, I'm going to have one foot facing the attacker. Okay? So if I were to do a front scoop kick or front shovel kick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my lead foot, the front foot, and I'm going to bring it up under the groin. But again, it's like a shovel. I'm going to hit and pull. It's this kind of motion. Okay? So from here, I'm scooping. So if he were my attacker, I come up, hit and pull. Okay, so we come in, one, two. It's nice because from this position, I can deploy another kick, I can escape if I need to. Um, I can also do it with the back leg, come up that way. So the, again, the basic motion is hit, up, pull, back. That's a scoop kick. The back kick, the, the rear position, is the spur kick. Now, spur kick is a little bit different because if I were to find myself in a reverse bow seg, in this kind of position, my heel is located directly under his groin. I, now, to get away, I'm going to step in that direction. But if I'm going to go in that direction, I might as well take something with me. So all I need to do is extend rear scoop kick, okay, is extend my heel up. It's the same motion that we did on the front scoop. We're doing back scoop, okay. From here, I say I hit the groin, I come up, hit, and exit. Spur kick, very similar. Get in this position. What I'm going to do is I'm going to deflect or ricochet off the ground. I'm going to kind of kick the ground and let that bounce my heel up into his groin. So if I came in with a buckle, hit the groin, all I need to do is I slightly bounce the, uh, my foot off, ball of my foot off the ground and spur the groin. So it looks kind of like this, boom, and just hit. Great kicks, they present themselves a lot in our self-defense techniques because from any buckle position, you can spur, you can scoop, and devastating because it's hitting a primary target the groin. That's the uh, scoop and spur kick. Next kick we, uh, we're going to show you is the back kick. Uh, the point, the weapon that we want to use on the back kick is we want to hit with our heel. And the motion we want to use is an upward angle diagonal kick. Uh, we'll also call it like a mule kick. When we're learning this kick in the beginning, a couple of principles. You want to make sure that you have your toe pointed down because that will make sure you're, th you're kicking in a straight line and you want to have your foot slightly bent. So from here, I'm going to look over my shoulder, the attacker's behind me. I want to bring my kick, cock it, and I want to bring it up and hit with my heel. Let me step a little bit away so I have more distance. Okay, so I want to bring it up and out. Now, I'm hitting here. I'm, ideally, I want to come on an upward angle, that way, hit with my heel. When you're practicing, a lot of people have a tendency to turn it into a side kick, and the way to fix that is by concentrating on keeping your toe pointed down. Okay. And again, I'm a little close. You want to come up on an angle like that. So it's a powerful kick. It's, it works just like a thrust kick. It pushes the attacker away, and uh, we use it in a lot of our techniques. So it's um, important you, you work on this toe pointed down, hitting with the heel. And when you're kicking, when you're practicing, you almost want to have your knees rubbed together so that you're coming on in a straight line here, this way. And 
avoid doing the side kick. Practice in the mirror, if you, if you notice that your foot is turning, uh, just the way to fix it is point your toes down. That's the back kick. Next thing we're going to cover is uh, spinning back kick. There's all types of spinning kicks. Basically all the kicks that we do we can also spin and do. Um, what I like about the spinning back kick is because a back kick alone is a powerful kick, by adding the spinning motion we're increasing the power because we're also adding the element of torque. There's three power principles we talked about. Torque, backup mass, marriage, gravity. By doing a spinning back kick you're adding torque to the backup mass and uh, it adds a lot of power. So from my uh, neutral bow, I'm gonna, I need to reposition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chain my body this way and I teach my students step back pigeon toe. And I want to look over the shoulder where I'm kicking and then I want to throw my back kick. Okay, now I could also throw a hook kick or a side kick. The spinning principle is the same, how we set it up is the same. Again, from our neutral bow, step, my toes are pigeoned, I pivot towards my target, and I throw the kick. You can do it this side, pivot, look, back kick. The spin is the same, doesn't matter, spin, boom. Again, breaking down the spin mechanics, whether you're doing a, whatever spinning kick you're doing, the mechanics are the same. From your neutral bow, you can bring your back foot up and pivot, or ideally you want to step away from the attack, so you want to bring your front foot back, turn towards your target, and you can do your back kick, you can do your side kick, you can do your hook kick, whatever spin kick you want to do. It's just mastering the spin. So that's spinning kicks, and uh, practice them when you're, when you're sparring. Next kick we want to show you is what we call the chicken kick. We use this in a lot of our self-defense techniques. It's actually deploying two types of kicks. So the mechanics of the kick, if we're in our left neutral bow, I want to bring my back knee up as if I was going to throw a front snap kick, but I'm not going to do that. It's deceptive because if I'm sparring or whatever and I throw that kick a few times and I do that, they think that kick is coming. What we're going to do though is from this chambered position, we're going to use the height of lifting our knee to get us off the ground and we're going to jump and kick with the other leg. So from our neutral bow, pivot, bring my knee up and then I jump into the chicken kick. Okay, other side, knee up, jump, kick. Target is the head, usually under the chin. It's great because if we're sparring and I'm able to land a few front kicks, and then he thinks, when he sees that chamber, I'm going to kick low line again, and I bring the other leg up and hit. It's, it's a great way to score points in a tournament, and on the street, it's devastating. It um, allows you to hit multiple targets. I'm going to have Jeff come out and demonstrate this kick, full contact. So if we were fighting here, okay, Jeff's going to do the kick, he comes up, boom, hits the head. Okay, I'll have him do it on the bag. Notice he's coming up under the chin. What more likely is going to happen is when he cocks the knee, the guy's going to look down because he's worried about that, and then that comes up and hits. Great deceptive kick, and uh, again, practice it. It's important. You're going to get your lift from getting the knee up. It's basically just a knee with a hop. Boom, and that's your chicken kick. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. To show you is the rear chicken kick. Uh, this is a great kick. It's, it's like the front chicken kick because it's deceptive and it, we used a, a setup kick to launch us into the follow-up kick. So if basically the way the kick looks, if I'm in my neutral bow, I'm going to launch like I'm doing a spinning back kick or spinning hook or spinning side. And if you're sparring, you may want to try that. Just hit him with the spinning kick a few times. That way when you go to do your uh, rear chicken kick, he's going to think that that kick is really coming. So we're going to pivot, and you got to sell it. You really got to get that foot up. 
and then allow that to launch you into your other kick. So from a neutral bow, we spin, launch, kick. I do it this way. Boom. I'm going to have Jeff come out and demonstrate the kick. And he's also going to show you a little bit how you can uh, use range with this kick, increase or decrease range. Okay, so we're sparring. Boom. Now, if he's done a spinning kick and hits me with it a few times, boom, okay? Now I might be, we're sparring, I might see, okay, that hurt. Now I see it again, he does it one more time, okay, boom, okay? I don't want to get kicked by that again. So when I see him spin, my focus is automatically going to go to that foot. I'm not thinking about that foot, and that's when you come in with this one. Boom. Great deceptive kick. Do it a little faster. Boom. Okay. A lot of power. You notice he's got torque and backup mass. Those are the power principles. He's got the power from the torque, and his whole body is behind the kick. You want to talk about range or anything? Yes. The last part of this kick is when you're, especially in a sparring tournament, a great way to close distance in case we're far apart is with this kick. Because with this launch, we can close that distance. Even if we get farther, I can still close that distance. Excellent point. And uh, again, you can use it offensively or defensively. It's a great kick. Use it when you're sparring. It's in our self-defense techniques, and uh, it's very effective. Rear chicken. Next kick we're going to show you is called the falcon kick. Now this is exactly mechanically just like a chicken kick. We get the knee up, and then we do the second kick uh, is going to be a roundhouse. So in a chicken kick, we're doing a knee front kick. Falcon kick, we're doing a knee roundhouse kick. I'm going to have Jeff come out and demonstrate the kick for you. Younger, more flexible than me. Okay. So from our fighting position, he's going to come up, knee, roundhouse. This would be one time where you can effectively and pretty consistently hit the head. Because again, if he set this kick up with a few good, strong front kicks, boom. Okay, now I'm worried about that kick. When I see that leg cock, my focus goes there. I may even drop my hands for a block. That's when he comes up with the roundhouse to the head. Great kick. Um, if, you're, if you're athletic enough to get the speed and timing down and pull it off consistently, you can score a lot of points in tournaments with this, and it is a fight ender if you're using it in a self-defense situation. That's the falcon kick. Next kick I want to show you is the crescent kick. Crescent basically gets its name from an arcing position, um, basically like a windshield wiper. We're going to come back with the kick like that. We have an inward crescent and an outward crescent. So if from my neutral bow, I can do this kick with my front or my rear leg. For, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to do it with my rear leg because it's a little more powerful. So if I'm going to do an inward crescent, I'm going to bring my back leg up. I'm hitting with the, ball, the side of my foot, and usually it's going to be a high level target. I can either hit the hand if it's up to open up a, a, up the head, or if the hand is down, I can do the crescent to the head. So from my neutral bow, I'm going to come up and do the inward crescent that way. It's just like a windshield wiper. I come up, like I'm kicking straight out, and I bring it across. Okay? Outward crescent, same thing, except I'm going in this direction. I'm going to come in and out. It's um, showed on Jeff. Can Jeff come out? Now again, I can set this kick up by doing it twice. I can do an outward crescent with my front hand to get his blocking hand out of the way, and then I can do an inward crescent with my rear foot to the head. So it's a great kick um, because you're using a lot of torque and you can get a lot of power into it. That's the crescent kick. Next kick we're going to show you is the hook kick. It's um, just like a hooking punch. We want to come out and across. So I want to, when I'm setting this kick up, again, I want to point my knee where I, I want to go. It almost looks like a side kick. From here, I'm shooting my leg out. At the last minute, I'm just going to hook it in. So the motion looks like a fish hook. So from here, I come in, out and hook. Again, out and hook. Um, 
You can also do it spinning a back leg. I can spin and hook. So I'll have Jeff come out. We'll demonstrate. I'm going to do a. Uh, can I have a jump switch? I'm going to do a front hook to show different targeting, and then I'll have Jeff do a spinning back hook. So from our neutral bow, I can do a front hook kick here. Okay, so I'll come up, front hook, then Jeff can do a spinning hook. Boom, there. Okay, I can do a spinning hook. Boom. Jeff can do a front hook. Boom. The motion doesn't matter whether you're doing right or left leg. You want to come out, and at the very last minute, you want to hook it like a fish hook. That is your hook kick. Next kick we're going to teach you is the side kick. The, again, there's several ways to deploy this kick depending on the situation you're in. If you're in a tournament setting, more likely than not, you're going to try to go for more of a power kick. Bruce Lee made this kick famous. Um, Self-defense situation is a great way to drive an attacker off of you. Uh, if you do um, a low line kick, we can do what's called a side, a, a snapping side kick, which would be targeted usually at the knees um, or joints. And again, that's a very powerful kick too. So I'll demonstrate the two types of side kicks, but the foot positioning remains the same. When we do the side kick, we want to kick with what we call the blade of the foot. It's the outside heel. So if I come out, the position is that way. You notice my toes are down, my foot is bladed. I'm actually hitting with the heel. And uh, that's where the power of the, the foot is. I want to have my toes pointed down, I'm cocking. Now, a roundhouse kick, I want to cock here because I want to get my hips in. With a side kick, I actually want to cock more toward my shoulder. I want to bring the kick up this way. So I'm going to come up, kick it out. Okay, do it from the side, come up, and kick it out. If I'm going to do a snapping side kick to the joint, though, it's low line, I don't need to um, cock my leg as far. I can cock it here, and again, I'm just going to blade the foot, but I want to snap it fast. Up, snap. Other side, snap. I'll have Jeff come out. My preference, again, self-defense situation. More likely than not, I'm going to go for the knee. So if we were here, I'm going to come up and I want to snap to the knee. I'm going to call a blade, boom, and recoil. Okay. If he were coming at me though, I could drive him off with a side kick this way. Come up here, bam, side kick that way. In a tournament setting, I'll let you do it. If he wants to close distance, say we're far away, take a step back. He can do a, a, a side kick, come at me, boom. So all he's doing is he's taking a cheat step and he's throwing the side kick. Not a great point scorer and a fight ender if you can pull it off fast and with a lot of power. So practice a side kick, it's a, it's a really effective.